welcome to the Virtual Happy Place Festival. I'm so glad that you could stop by when you're, you're not even in the UK. Where are you in the world? I'm in Tangier, I'm in Morocco. So this was kind of a pre-lockdown trip and now you're out there for however long. It was a bit of a, I don't really know what is happening in the world. And my partner was in Morocco and come to make sure her dad was taking this all seriously. And I just thought, okay, I've got an option here. I either I leave and potentially have to miss home for a little while. I didn't think it long as it's now panning out to me. Um, or I have to be at home and miss my partner. And I thought, sod it, I'm gonna make the jump. And how's it been? Like, how, are you, how are you finding it out there? I mean, it's a, obviously it's a strange situation for everyone, but to not be at home and to kind of be processing what's going on, how are you finding it? Um, up and down, to be honest. Um, it's like, obviously, there's most of the things that I miss are superficial, but I really do yeah. miss my dog. Not, they're not a superficial part of my life. And um, my home isn't superficial either, because that's where I've built for, you know, that's, that's the place where I find solace. That's where I retreat to, and, and that's where I relax and I process and, you know, I find comfort and I feel safe. And, you know, don't get me wrong, we are very safe here. If anything, looking at what's happening, on, I don't know how reliable the news is, but it's quite interesting being out of the country and the only insight that I have into going on at home is the news. Um, but it, yeah, it feels a lot calmer here than it, it looks in England. They're having none of the same problems apart from the obvious one. With, um, but people here are very respectful of the lockdown, which was implemented um, ahead of the UK's. And it's a lot more strict as well. We have to have um, uh, pieces of paper with our address on and our ID, ID to leave the house. And we can only go as far as the closest supermarket. Wow. But the supermarkets, no one to stop by. You know, the shelves are full. Of, oh. of anything that you, people are patient and respectful of space. No one's imposing or running around like a headless chicken blue roll, which is quite refreshing. Well, and have you had any, I mean, it's kind of a cliche, but I think we're all sensing it and we're all talking about it amongst ourselves. Are you having any, I don't know if you'd call them epiphanies, but certainly a new introspection considering what's going on and where you're at because we've got less distraction and I guess a lot of the time more time to think. I think that's a really double-edged sword. It's a bit of a gift and a curse having too much time. To, um, it's weird, right? So because there's a lack of distraction, I feel like I should be being much more productive, but I'm finding it quite hard to sit still. And that might have something to do with the fact we haven't been allowed to go for a walk for be eight weeks on Sunday. Um, I'm still exercising, which burns off a bit of the restlessness, but not all of it. And I'm finding it quite hard to finish things. I, I, yeah, weirdly, it's not made me feel more focused. It's probably made me feel less so. But that's, you know, that's the change in routine. The, the, the change is, is huge. And a lot of the choices that I normally make day to day have been taken away from me. So I guess... I'm just trying not to beat myself up too much. In the beginning, I was like, right, you've got to take something out of this. You've got to take something from this time. And now I'm a little bit more like, just take each day as it comes. Yeah, and I mean, that's a lesson for us all in itself, that it's all right just to be and just to exist without having to have these goals. And like, you're obviously a very driven person. So to step away from that mindset and to just exist is tricky I, I i've certainly struggled with that hence why we're doing this festival i think in the first place is that i want to keep a momentum and i want to keep you know engaging in interesting conversation and i i'm not very good at just being i do find that quite tricky so i guess for everyone there's an element of that and there's an acceptance that we have to have and um and that's a healthy thing i think acceptance is really is a really good point. I think that was the point where it switched for me. You know, I was kind of holding on to maybe this is going to be over sooner than everyone's saying. And I was, I'm not often that optimistic, but in this situation, weirdly, I was or hopeful. Um, and then, you know, things have transpired as they have. And, you know, the, the problem's severe. This is a real problem. Because uh, it, it's, the, it's the first time in my lifetime, in many people's, um, that this is, you know, everyone across the world is suffering a varying degree of the exact same thing and in one way it kind of brings us closer together but it's done everything to take us further apart you know the lack of social engagement i was 
anxious about even having this conversation. I'm not used to seeing faces that I this don't see it. every day. And- <laughs> I know, isn't the it so bad? It's day. so boring. By the time the festival actually goes live for everyone to look at, and by the time these conversations go out, maybe there will be change and maybe there will be a loosening of the lockdown and we will start integrating and seeing each other again. But I do think there is going to be some anxiety about pace picking back up again and and you know socializing and, and having people to your home or, or or going out it's you know that's it seems like a positive now but it's also going to feel very strange i think once we have to immerse ourselves back in the real world yeah i think there'll be some real remnants from this i don't think it's just going to be back to life as it no was way. everyone keeps talking about no everyone keeps talking about what the new normal is going to be but i think for a little while this 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 is going to be a new normal. And there's a lot of anxiety that comes with that because I suppose what this has really made us aware of is how vulnerable people in our families are. You know, we might not be the most vulnerable by our age or, or circumstances. And, you know, for those of us who don't have, have underlying health conditions, but, you know, we've all got elders in our family. Do I have to worry about going to see my nan every time I've seen a friend? I can't. You know, no one can be certain who they've bumped into and whether or not they've caught something that doesn't show its face. Symptom, like you don't become symptomatic for two weeks. That's really scary. Oh, I know. Uh, it's I the worst my, of it. I yeah. Cuddle, you know? I, I know. just, like, the idea of having to isolate for two weeks every time you go and see someone that may be vulnerable, it, it's, this is going to have real impact. It will. And like, you know, I'm thinking about how it's affecting my young kids already because when we're out on the street and you know, my daughter is, she's kind of like very practical at a very young age and she's really going mum there's a person coming we need to move out the way and i i don't want them to have that anxiety you know as a hangover from this and that's you know all of it's going to take a bit of work and and all of it's going to take um you know some good positive mental attitude where we can get it and i'm sure we will have all built up um a little bit of strength in new ways from this experience and it's something i desperately wanted to talk to you about today not only because we've been through these weird times but because i think you are um so well educated on the subject from life experience and that is resilience and i guess where i want to start is do you think resilience um can only be accessed if you've experienced pain oh um, I'm trying to think. I mean, even on like a very basic level, if you're pushing yourself in a in a physical manner, I guess you still do have to. I'm trying to find a way around this in which you can become resilient without experiencing pain. But even the physical aspect of it, you know, becoming more physically resilient and stronger, you have to push yourself through pain. Um, give me a chance to come back to this because later yeah. on in the conversation. Might change my mind but for yeah, now I'm going to say no. I think you do have to to experience some level of discomfort or pain in order to understand how resilient you are and I think resilience is really important because throughout all of this conversation and and it's it's great conversation it's good that people are now talking about mental health issues as openly as they are and that a bit of the taboo is being removed and there's there's more understanding um, of it But I just, I think something that's been lost along the way is resilience. It's not something you hear enough about. And I think it's really important that people are encouraged to remember that, you know, us as humans are pretty blimmin' resilient. It's so true. Where is that coming from? You know, we must embody it all on a level, but perhaps don't, it doesn't reveal itself because it's not needed and and we just don't understand that we've got that strength within and we might view ourselves as being you know unable to cope at times or to to dread something awful happening because we don't think we can cope but actually that strength is within all of us it's just a circumstance that really draws it out perhaps yeah and i think sadly sometimes it takes quite negative circumstances or quite trying circumstances to 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 pull that out of us and for us to draw from that um, but I guess the important thing is that it is there. And I think people feel a lot better for being reminded that it is there sometimes. I mean, without, without a doubt, without a doubt. There's still, there's still points in my life where I'm like, I could just do with things being a little bit more linear now. Uh, you know, I, I've, I don't want to encounter a pandemic right now. I could do without <laughs> it. Well, 
I know. I mean, uh, God, but you've everything. had you've had an extraordinary life, and I think any of us who have watched your documentaries or heard you speak in interviews um, feel a sense of gratitude that you're willing to be so open and honest about your own experience and your own stories and um, and especially being a male because unfortunately there is still a tendency to not discuss emotions and feelings and and you've really helped to move that stigma on you were you were kind of born into to a challenging situation and I wonder when you realized that well I, I guess I wonder when you realized it was it was challenging you know at what age did you think this is hot this is hard the situation I'm in and this is you know, and I am actually um, perhaps now experiencing negative outcomes from my circumstance. Do you know what? It was more in hindsight that I noticed it because right. growing up, it wasn't, it wasn't like I was born in, in Wiltshire and then at 13, my family lost all of their money and I ended up in a council flat in Upper Clapton in Hackney. You know, if that happened, then I would have had some perspective and there would have been a shock. But for me growing up, in the environment I did, everything was just as it was. It wasn't until, until much later on really, you know, looking back on it and going, ah, okay, so that, that did have an effect on me, albeit it was completely normal for me. It, it wasn't how things necessarily should be. And then it takes time to, to overcome all of that because it's time passed. You can't change it. It doesn't do you a great deal of good to wish for something that wasn't because it's never going to be, not unless you make active decisions to change, you know, the things that you have control over that you can alter in the time that you find yourself in. Mm, I think, you know, it's so often the case that when you're living through something that's particularly tricky, you don't notice, especially if there was, you know, not something that was drastically um, varying from that in the first place. And then in hindsight, you have to, you have to process it and work through it. Um, your nan brought you up and she was, I'm imagining your kind of backbone through a lot of, of you figuring stuff out. Did you use her as a soundboard? Did you talk to her? Did you try and process stuff with her growing up? No, to be honest, it, we didn't, we didn't talk about stuff. I mean, we're, we're getting a bit better and, you know, by actually, actually by way of my first documentary, we had a conversation about what yeah. happened later on when he took his own life but it took making that documentary for me and my nan to sit down and have that conversation and it's crazy to think that we had that conversation it was the first time that we had spoken about it since um since really since he had, he had taken his own life uh, it was many many years that passed um and then for us to sit down and talk and for the first time it's happening for it to be on camera was was uncomfortable but it brought about the conversation and it not just with not just with my nan but um, friends of mine who watched that documentary understood, you know, I got a phone call from one of my best mates, Felix, and he had watched it. And we, we grew up together from, I, I don't know when we first met, four, five, six, um, when we were growing up in Hackney. Um, and he just said, I understand a lot more now. And I didn't realize that there was a hell of a lot that we hadn't communicated. Mm. I mean, me and Phil, I was like, I don't know, we must have been nearly 30 by the time we'd like plucked up the courage to say, I love you too, when we put the phone down, you know? Yeah, but these are great changes that are, you know, happening all over the place. And it's so, it's so for the positive. And I think, you know, I'm making a total general assumption here, but I think, you know, the, the generation that your nan's from, you know, my parents are from, and a lot of my friends' parents, that generation have always found it quite difficult to perhaps say what they think or to look at life in a way like that and to be able to discuss it and articulate feelings around it because they weren't taught to you by their parents. You know, the, the kind of post-war generation and trying to plow through things and be stoic, I think, stopped that generation in their tracks. And it's, um, it's a tricky thing to, you know, for you to then have to impact because I'm imagining for you to have that conversation with your nan was terrifying. Yeah. And you can tell, I mean, it doesn't take much to, to see, you don't have to watch much of it to, to see how kind of awkward we are about it and how stern she seems when she's not. She's one of the most caring people I know. She's brilliant. But I had, um, talking of post-war, my great-grandmother was in the house until I was 13 when she passed away, um, Nanny Edie. And Aww. she lived through both of us. 
um, and the World Cup that we won. But she was, <laughs> it was, it's weird because there was obviously quite a breakdown in communication between her and, and her daughter, my grandmother, Nanny Pat. Um, but she was, you know, I guess because I was the great grandchild, I just got the sensitive side of Edie. And while my nan was out working three jobs a day, it was my nanny Edie who was there sitting and, and reading to me and teaching me numer numeracy. Um, and I think a lot of the good in me comes from the times I spent with her. She was definitely the reason that, <clears throat> that I worked so hard for, I guess, positive validation. I, the time I did spend in school, um, I was, I, was, I was really good. I was, I was bright. Um, and I probably could have done a lot more academically had I stayed at school. But because I, I, I used to, when I went to school, there was, there was a bit of my great grandmother in every one of the teachers. So I sought positive validation instead of being a little rebel. The, the rebel period came later on. And, and at what point did you realize that you'd built up any sort of resilience? You know, is that something again that's come way later down the line when you've gone as much as you, I'm sure would, would like to not have been through such challenging circumstances. Is there a sort of a gratitude now that you've got a resilience that perhaps other people haven't tapped into yet? Yeah, definitely. Um, I said something on the outro to one of, I think it was a song, yeah, it was a song called Avalon. And I, I said the damage become dangerous because we know we can survive. Uh, it does, it makes you, you know, I mean, danger negative connotations attached to that word but it does man knowing that you can survive something doesn't mean you know it's not an, an excuse to just press the red button whenever you're lacking inspiration which is something i think can become quite a, a negative cycle people who find themselves in the arts have been through a lot of shit tend to go okay well everything's a bit too calm and, and easy right now where's my inspiration let me self -care. i've definitely been guilty of it at points in my life um but I think something I'm grateful for is it's weird to say that I'm grateful for having been through all of that, but I kind of am, you know, there's bits hypothetically that I'd change, but people always ask me that, what would you change if you could go back in time? And hypothetically I'd change everything, you know, but being here where I am now, even in the middle of a pandemic away from my two dogs and my home that I miss dearly, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change anything because I wouldn't be where I am. I wouldn't be who I am and I wouldn't know what I've, what I know. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have learned everything that I have. And, and where did your, um, where did your sort of decision making come from? You know, is that influenced by your nanny or great nan? Because, you know, when we've been through something awful and we've lived through something that felt, you know, either tricky at the time or retrospectively did, you can, you can have, you know, there are two very clear choices. And one is to, like you say, self-destruct, um, be a, be a, choose to be a victim and, and imagine that everything awful only ever happens to you and act out because of it. Or you can be at where you're at now, and I'm sure it took a lot of work and a lot of you know, different moments to get you to where you're at now, where you, you, where you do have gratitude and you do see the resilience rather than it being a weakness, bad luck, a shitty hand, etc. You know, how... How have you learned to make those good mental choices? Um, by making a lot of the same mistakes repeatedly. Uh, yeah. it's a, it, I, I, there's things like sometimes when I, when I hear old, old music or demos and stuff that I've written, a lot of what I was thinking at the time came out through my music. And I hear stuff and it's like my subconscious was trying to tell me what, I don't know, probably years of therapy would have eventually uncovered because I hear stuff and I'm like, how did I put that in my song and clearly have some understanding of it then, but not enough self-awareness to realize that that advice or making that change would have really helped me at that moment. How has it taken me all these years after to understand something that I had some grasp of, but didn't really realize. Yeah. Yeah. But just trying to make, it's, it's trying to make better decisions and being a part of my problem was I was, I was quite impulsive. Um, and quite reactive. And, you know, I grew up in a relatively chaotic household where everyone was quite reactive. That's what happens when people live on top of each other, you know, and you're in the confines of a small space, which I'm sure is what a lot of people are experiencing now, especially in this time when you don't have the freedom to leave the house and go for a walk as you so please, or to go and see your friends, to socialize, to decompress. Um, and 
that was part of me for a long time and I still have it in me now, but I, I for the most part, have learned to take a breath, to sleep on things um, and to not attach to myself to everything that happens. And it, it's quite, it, you know, it's a, it's a learning curve. That's like, you know, to be able to be completely free from what happens around you and to not attach yourself to any of it or respond or react to any of it is like Zen level 10. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, like, I'm like Zen level three and a half, but I'm, I'm getting... <laughs> And, but the difference between like level zero and level three and a half is huge. And my life, is, I swear, like my life is exponentially better because of it. I don't have that. I don't have the, because the thing is when you, I think when, you know, people talk about men and emotions, it's not even emotions. It's just one emotion. It's anger. And that's yeah. how people are men expressing because we're not from a young age, really encouraged, depending on the household, and the environment encouraged to understand our feelings, to be able to communicate them. And there wasn't those kind of conversations in my household. So I didn't really know how to express myself, but I'm incredibly sensitive and emotional. Um, People used to think I was hard. I'm not hard. There's a real difference between being hard and being strong. Strength comes from being aware of your emotions, your feelings and your vulnerabilities. That's that's real strength. Hard is, is a facade. That's a lyric. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> buy a new album this minute after this conversation ends <laughs> hard as a facade I love that how do you go about choosing to be um, hopeful or not freaked out and scared of everything um, versus being terrified that something awful is going to happen again because you face challenges how, how do you navigate that that's a tough one um, I'm really good at catastrophizing as well and it happens here. It doesn't, it's not something I talk about because if I were to talk about what I was worrying about, I'd realize how stupid it sounds. Mm. Uh, sometimes what I do is I just vocalize things, you know, and be it whether it's my partner Karima or one of my pals just goes, what are you on about? You're being an, an, an idiot. You're being a muppet. Like, mm. What are you worried about that for? Thing is, uh, we got a great ability. Like our imaginations are incredible, right? But when used for positive, I guess, you know, the negative aspect of our imagination is, is the ability to join dots and see patterns in things that aren't really there, especially if you're OCD. Yeah. Um, and to then, you know, it's just, it's crazy how stuff like that can start from the, the smallest worry, the most minute fear about something so small. And then inside your own head, that can manifest and become this huge thing. Mm-hmm. I just... I, you know, I've got much, much, much better at not worrying about what's out of my control and not trying to control too much. That makes things a lot easier because as soon as you start worrying about stuff that you can't control, you start trying to take control, you know, obsessively of the things that you can. And that's not a good place to be. I've been there in this yeah. time as well. Like with all of this time to think it would be really easy to end up, end up down that that rabbit hole but um, oh I mean I do it all the time like I certainly am I know that I find it very hard to just let go you know I've definitely sort of learned this lesson during lockdown a lot more so because I've had days where you know my kids are just being crazy and work's gone a bit awry and I'm behind on everything and I've done the bloody laundry or whatever and I just in my head have had to go I surrender I surrender. Like if it all goes to shit, you know, does it matter? You know, no, not really. And just bring it back to that. But in real life, normally I'm terrible at that. And I do want to control everything. And I think, you know, I, I think it is such a deeply rooted psychological situation that at times it, it does feel a bit impossible and you know, you just have to go, Oh, well, I can't do that today. And just you know well, that's, that's what we were talking about earlier and i think i i tried to explain why acceptance was good and then i segued because i do that a lot because my brain is just all over the gap <clears throat> but as soon as you accept something even if it's just to sit with a feeling yeah. you know be it fear or panic and however irrational it might seem if you just sit with something go, okay okay that's how i feel almost immediately it dissipates and you're like yeah ah what was I giving that so much energy for? And you know, it's like everything is, and you know, look, things are episodic. I think it's, it's really natural to have those thoughts and feelings, but the sooner you realize, like the sooner you, you learn to, to spot them, 
I think things get a bit easier because you go, okay, I know where this leads and I know it. Come on in. Yeah, yeah. bring it on. Bring yeah, come on in. Panic attacks. Like, go on then. Do, go, give us your worst. Give us a panic attack right now as I'm trying to fall asleep at 11 p.m. Hit me. And it does. Yeah, and it, you've it got goes, to be up at the end the next morning as well. That's the way it, sleep anxiety was a huge problem for me. Especially yeah. with, you know what it's like. Work, if you work night and day, I'd be coming back from a gig somewhere. I'd have to be up at you know, half six or something or earlier to go and do a morning TV show. And then I'd be like, right, I've got six hours to sleep. I have to sleep in this six hours. And an hour before I've got into my bed while I'm still in the car driving, I'm like, I'm not going to sleep. I'm not going to sleep. I'm not going to sleep. Ah. And it's all of that. It's the build up. It's the worrying about things. And you always tend to paint a picture worse than the reality. I know. Nearly I know I still have got over that one like the sleep one is it's a bit better these days but I've had to say goodbye to things I really enjoyed because so like I'll be really honest and I've talked about it a teeny bit but not massively but I was covering for Zoe on the breakfast show on radio Two, and that exact anxiety you're talking about I had every time I covered so I wouldn't sleep for like two weeks at all I mean I would probably drift for like 20 minutes just before my alarm would go off but I would be awake all night panicking because I knew that there was this definite early morning wake up and I had to be on it and because of all these definites my brain was like sorry we're not going to fulfill any of those wishes today you're going to be exhausted you're not going to be on your a game bye good luck on live radio with loads of people listening so I had to step away from it because I I did it for you know nearly a year and I I just couldn't find a solution. I think sometimes you have to surrender in a different way, which is just making changes to make your life a bit easier sometimes. You don't have to be like, you know, this is why I think resilience is interesting because resilience for me in that situation wasn't, I have to plow through, I have to keep doing the show, I've got to deal with this. My resilience was, I'm going to be strong enough to say goodbye to something that I really, really love. And, you know, life is a bit shit sometimes and that's just it. You've hit a nail on the head there, though, right? Because resistance is resilience. Sorry, is is also about it's about elasticity and yeah. and protection. So you can stretch and stretch and stretch and stretch, but you can only stretch so far. And it's about you know the protection element of it is knowing your boundaries and it's putting things in place to protect you from negatives you may encounter. In that yeah. instance, the only you know the only way you could do that was to to stop doing the show, to protect yourself, which is important. Sleep is one of the most important things. I read a book um, called Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker, and it was I've one been of... Um, I've been avoiding that book. Yeah, I, do you know what? I kind of wish I had, but now I've, I've, I've read and listened to it and gone back and read parts of it again. And it's on one hand, the, just the forward is, is one of the most anxiety-inducing bits of information <laughs> ever digested. Ever, but on the other hand, it's really, really, really informative, and it makes you go, "Okay, if there's one thing that I'm going to put time into, it's improving my quality of sleep." Mm, it's so. It cool. kind of says you can you can eat well, you can exercise, you can do all of these things to take care of yourself. But if you're not getting enough sleep, they're all pretty much redundant. This is it, and it, no one wants to hear that. Everyone, you know, it's boring. Everyone wants to be like, "You don't need sleep," you know, the whole sleep when you're dead thing, but. Oh my God, I, at this age, certainly I need sleep. And, and if you already, I think, deal with anxiety, depressive episodes, mm-hmm. it, you can't, I can't take the risk. I don't want to take the risk. It's, it's not it, worth it. it just, your capacity to, to be resilient, I think. A lack of sleep, you know, it's like you become more reactive. <clears throat> you become more penetrable as well. Yeah, yeah. It's a, like every night that you don't get a good night's sleep is like a chink in your armor. This is it. This is it, my God. Um, Stephen, I could literally, I mean, I feel like we could, we could talk about sleep for about a week um, and then get back to resilience and all sorts of stuff. There's so much to talk about. And I'd love to talk to you again at some point. You're going to have to come on the podcast and do like a proper hour-long chat because I'm, I'm really in awe of your resilience and also I'm really um, just so grateful for what you've done for many communities and people dealing with, similar issues and uh, myself included so keep doing what you're doing and um and stay safe and get back home to your dogs whenever you can safely and um and we'll speak soon take care thank you steven thank you.